Oh yes. What's going on guys, Sean Evergoing All Gamer finally resurrecting this channel from whatever grave I left it in and bringing with me something new and something a little bold. Today I'm starting something of a series of reviews for the Metal Gear Solid series. It's gonna be long, it's gonna be detailed, but most importantly, it's gonna be awesome. So, let's waste no time, get right on into it. So it's been 31 years since the release of the first Metal Gear game, and since then, between the 8 sequels and the various spin-offs this series has seen, it's become one of the biggest franchises in gaming to date. And that was no small feat. Each entry into this series has greatly expanded on the formula set up in the early games, and some bring entirely new features that completely enhance the gameplay and overall the player experience. Hopefully by the end of this marathon we'll see just how much this series has grown over the years and ultimately how it became the monumental beast that it is today. Now before I get carried away I want to lay down some ground rules about what's actually going to go on in this series. The first being that I'm only going to be recovering... Recovering? I'm only going to be covering the main games in the Metal Gear Solid franchise, except for Portable Ops, mainly because Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker does kind of forget about that game. So there's really no point in me actually going out and trying to play it and then review it. This also means that the Metal Gear Acid Ghost Babel and the God Awful Survive will also be left on the cutting room floor. Mainly because they take place in their own timelines and would kind of be irrelevant to cover in this series. However, I am going to be covering the spin-off Metal Gear Rising Revengeance as Hideo Kojima was hugely involved in developing the story for that game. And I consider it canon, so I will be covering that one. Secondly, I'm going to do my best to keep these reviews as unbiased as possible. It's very easy for me to rhyme off praise for these games, like stupidly easy. And that would not be constructive criticism at all. So I'm going to keep them as unbiased to the point, picking out the pros and cons of each game and hopefully it all works out. Now there's a lot to cover in this series and absolutely no time to waste. So without further ado, welcome to the Metal Gear Solid series. In 1987, a game designer working at Konami named Hideo Kojima was put in task of designing and directing an action game for the MSX, which at the time was a popular games console in Japan. Seriously, the furthest into the western market that this console got was Argentina and continental Europe. It never broke the mold in America, but was hugely popular in Japan and was considered the go-to console for Konami at the time. After brainstorming the best route to go with this, due to the limitations of the MSX, it couldn't really handle a lot of sprites on screen at the one time, Kojima decided to focus the game on stealth and not pure balls to the wall action, and from this, Metal Gear was born. Now while the Metal Gear Solid series has become synonymous over the years for its over the top storylines and extremely lengthy cutscenes, the plot of Metal Gear is pretty rudimentary and now that I think about it, so is the rest of the game. This is essentially Metal Gear in its most basic form. And that's not a bad thing considering that this was the first in the series and was released on a fairly underpowered platform at the time. There was a lot this game got right and a lot that it absolutely misses the mark on. But before we dive into the gameplay and stuff, let's talk about the story and find out where this series began. So here's your mandatory spoiler warning. Spoilers. The game opens with Fox Agent Solid Snake infiltrating a fortress known as Outer Heaven. Once inside, Snake receives a radio call from his superior Big Boss, who tells him to find Grave Fox, another Fox agent who infiltrated Outer Heaven a few days prior, but went missing. Before going missing, however, Grave Fox transmitted a two-worded message that simply read, Metal Gear. Snake's primary objective is to find Grave Fox and learn about Metal Gear. Snake is also informed that he will be helped by Resistance members Kyle Schneider, Diane, and Jennifer. With his orders received, Solid Snake commences Operation Intrude Entry 1 Tree, and the game begins. After exploring the base for a while and rescuing a few hostages along the way, Snake is told that the only way to get close to Grey Fox is by getting captured. So, he goes and gets himself captured, is brought to a cell in the basement, and after punching a wall a couple of times, finally meets Grey Fox. Grey Fox explains that Metal Gear is a walking battle tank capable of launching a nuclear strike from anywhere on the planet, and that the only person who knows how to destroy the machine is its creator, Dr. Drago Petrovich Madnar. Fox tells Snake to go and find Madnar, and as he's leaving the cell, Snake encounters the first boss of the game, Shotmaker. Now normally a boss unit in a Metal Gear game usually has a really detailed background that is somehow linked into the overall plot of the game, but in this game, bosses just seem to appear, introduce themselves, you have a fight, they die and are never ever spoken of again. 
There'll be more on that later. Fun fact though, if you call Diane during a boss fight, she can give you tips on how to beat them. But earlier in the game, it's her brother Steve who answers as Diane is out either shopping or is in the shower. God, you just can't get any decent help these days. Anyways, Snake beats Shotmaker and makes his way to the roof where he parachutes down to the courtyard only to find that Madnar has been moved to building 2. So it's off to building 2 where Snake finds Madnar in the basement except it's not Madnar but instead someone waiting to spring a trap. Snake avoids the trap and discovers that Madnar is on the second floor. Snake finds the real Madnar only to be told that the good doctor won't reveal how to destroy Metal Gear until Snake rescues his daughter Ellen who for some reason is also in Outer Heaven and that is never ever explained, like at all. Snake makes his way back down to the basement rescues Ellen and then goes back to Madnar who explains that to destroy Metal Gear he needs 16 sets of plastic explosive and has to attach them to the legs where the armour is the weakest. Snake then makes his way over to building 3 where Metal Gear is being kept. Around this time things start to get weird. Big Boss starts to give misleading information and before Schneider can reveal the identity of the leader of Outer Heaven he's cut short and you don't actually find out what happened to him. Snake makes his way to the basement of building 3 where he finds Metal Gear and after a back and forth with lasers and explosives, Snake destroys the tank and somehow starts the self-destruct sequence for Outer Heaven. Trying to escape, Snake encounters the leader of Outer Heaven who turns out to be Big Boss. Snake kills Big Boss and makes his escape, Outer Heaven explodes and Snake comes home, job done. The credits then roll and afterwards a radio transmission comes in from Big Boss saying it's not over, we'll meet again or at least something along those lines. And that is the entire story of Metal Gear and as you can see compared to other games in this series it is very, very simplistic. It's straight to the point and extremely easy to follow. That being said, after experiencing the rest of this series before this game, I really love the change of pace it brought. Sure the story beats are small and predictable but at least they're there and even though I knew exactly what was going to happen, I still got a rush of excitement when it was all revealed at the end. The fact that a game released in 1987 can provoke that kind of a reaction in a person playing this 31 years on? I gotta admit, that's pretty impressive. But that's really all I can say on the plot, so let's move on and see how this game actually looks and plays today. Now I'm reviewing this game based on the version released with the Metal Gear Solid HD collection for the PlayStation 3, so I can't say how the original MSX version was, but overall this game plays pretty well. The controls are easy to wrap your head around, mainly because they're mapped similarly to later games in the franchise, so if you've played any of those games like Metal Gear Solid 1 or 2, then you pretty much know how this game works. First, let's talk game design. Now I don't know what it is but I have such a soft spot for 8-bit games whether it's the music which in this game I must say is amazing or just the pixel art graphics I don't know what it is. For a game released in 1987 Metal Gear looks amazing and the graphical upscale that came with the remastered version gives the colours a more vibrant and deeper tone. Trust me the footage you're seeing right now is not doing it any justice at all. That being said, I couldn't help but feel that as you progress further into the game, every area just seems to blend into one. The same textures are used for every building and they all seem like the same place even though you're moving from location to location. The level design is great in building 1 and is designed specifically to encourage the item progression system that's in place, more on that later. However, as you move into building 2, things start to get tedious. Every room and floor in building 2 is littered with guards and traps and it's near impossible to get through here without setting off an alarm. Building 2 is also made up of two elevators, one that goes up and one that goes down, so in order to progress you have to find the right elevator, which can be a pain if you don't have the right key cards. More on those later. The game is broken up into different screens, with each screen showing a new part of the current building you're in. Each screen has its own guard patrols and traps. Now something that is kind of annoying but surprisingly helpful at times is the fact that these screens reset themselves when you leave. What do I mean by that? Well let's say you enter a screen and there's two guards in it. If you take those two guards out, leave and come back, they'll have respawned. This can be annoying if you just spent the last few minutes taking out the guards only to have them respawn straight after you leave, especially if you have to backtrack, which there is quite a bit of in this game. That being said, bosses do not respawn, so thankfully you won't have to fight the same boss twice. Not that that would be a total issue though, definitely more on that later. However, this feature is most helpful when it comes to ammo and rations. If you enter a screen with either or both of these items, you can collect them, leave, and when you come back, they'll have respawned. So you can pretty much keep coming and going from the room until you're fully stocked up. Metal Gear's core gameplay is based around stealth, puzzle solving, and item progression. Stealth is pretty explanatory, and I'll talk about it more in a moment, but the item progression essentially encourages you to make your way through the areas, picking up key cards, weapons, and other items, which open up doors and help you solve puzzles. Each door is opened by a different card level with a total of 8 cards in the game. If you play Metal Gear Solid or Metal Gear Solid 2, you know about the card system and by Metal Gear Solid 2, the card system was pretty much streamlined to the point where you didn't even need them equipped to open the doors. In this game, however, every card is its own item and it's not clearly shown which card opens what door, so as you progress, you'll find yourself standing in front of doors trying every card to see which one works. This wouldn't really be an issue, only that these situations usually happen in the worst places imaginable and I will talk more about that later. 
Puzzles in this game are pretty simple, but at times actually require some thought and are kind of cool when you figure them out. Take rescuing Ellen Madner, for example. In order to get to Ellen, you have to go through this dark area, and I mean literally, you can't see anything when you enter it. The only way to get through here is to find the flashlight on the upper floors and then equip it in that area. This is how the item progression helps with puzzles when you literally need a certain item in order to progress. That's pretty clever, I must say. Now stealth has you doing the usual, avoid guards and cameras and try not to raise an alarm. The game introduces the cardboard box and cigarettes to help you get past cameras and lasers, both items still remain in the series right up to the phantom pain. Avoiding guards is easy enough, however that's mostly down to the silly AI. Guards can see you, but only if you're standing right in front of them, meaning you can get as close to guards as you want and as long as you're not directly in their line of sight, they will not see you. Another staple feature of the Metal Gear series are the detailed codec calls that reveal details on the story or tips on how to solve puzzles. In this game the radio calls are not half as detailed, you can only call your buddies in certain areas and anywhere else just gets you radio silence. Big Boss fills in for the usual Colonel Campbell in this game, giving the player information on certain areas and items, but sometimes this is more annoying than helpful. Take this gas room you encounter early in the game, Big Boss doesn't tell you that you need a gas mask until after you've entered the room because he forgot to mention it, but you're already losing health at this point. Also, leaving these rooms forces you to equip a key card which removes your gas mask so you'll be losing health while you're slogging through your inventory looking for the right card. Big Boss also informs you that Schneider knows where said gas mask and other items are, but Schneider just gives you a general direction on where to go to find them, which in a game that has no compass or map, basically no real way of knowing where you are, just comes off as tedious and unhelpful. Big Boss also doesn't tell you what Schneider's frequency is and I'm assuming it was originally included in the game's manual. That's all well and good but I'm playing a ported version of this game 31 years after its initial release. And yes, I know all I have to do is whip out my phone and type a few words into Google and I'll find it. But really the guys over Bluepoint Games could have programmed a few extra lines of text to make up for the information that was provided in the manual. I make it sound like I'm being lazy but doing this would help boost immersion and wouldn't slow the pace of the game. Also, while we're on the topic of tedious and unhelpful information, this game is also lacking in a serious amount of information. It doesn't really explain a whole lot to you. For example, while making your way through building 2, you have to get card 7 from a boss called Bloody Brad, but Bloody Brad is only vulnerable to attacks from a rocket launcher. However, the only way to get the rocket launcher is to call Jennifer, and she'll prepare it for you, but this is never explained in the game at all, and unless you call Jennifer by chance after getting a radio frequency, you won't be able to figure this out. Unless, of course, you look it up online, but we've been over that, so let's move on. The game also doesn't fully explain the class system it has. The class system is pretty simplistic. Rescuing hostages gains you a star, and each star lets you carry more ammo and rations. You also can't contact Jennifer unless you've reached the highest class, so if you haven't been rescuing hostages, good luck getting past Bloody Brad. You can also lose a class rank if you accidentally kill a hostage, and this is fine. I never really got the urge to shoot a hostage during the game except towards the end when you're fighting the boss Dirty Duck who has surrounded himself with three hostages, one of which just happens to be Jennifer's brother. Accidentally killing these hostages will lower your class, yet another thing the game doesn't tell you, so you won't be able to contact Jennifer and on top of that, if you're not class level 4 you won't be able to carry the 16 sets of plastic explosive needed to beat Metal Gear, so you can't actually beat the game. I think the most annoying part about that is the fact that the Dirty Duck fight happens so close to the end and if you've been rescuing hostages all the way through, there won't be any more to free, so your class rank isn't going back up. And that's a lovely way to bring up the bosses of this game. So remember earlier when I said the bosses of this game don't really add anything to the story? Well, the reason for that is the fact that there is no explanation as to who they are or why they're here. In fact, the only boss who has a shred of character development is Big Boss, and that's mostly down to the discovery of him being the leader of Outer Heaven. I'm going to assume again that some of this information might have been in the game's manual, but again, we've already been over that. The boss fights in this game are also stupidly easy, mostly requiring you to stay in one corner out of their firing line until it's safe to poke out and fire back. And sometimes you don't even have to move from that spot like in the Hind D fight in the one with Fire Trooper. Apart from Big Boss and Metal Gear itself, the rest of the boss fights are pretty forgetful and one of those two I mentioned doesn't even move. Metal Gear just stands there and lets you attack. Yes, even though it's the first Metal Gear to appear in the series, the TX-55 Metal Gear stands perfectly still and is instead protected by these cameras that shoot lasers. I mean, it's not great, but it leaps and bounds better than what players of the NES version of this game got, where Metal Gear was swapped out for a supercomputer. I would talk about the other changes made to the NES version, but I'd probably need another video to do that, so I'm just gonna leave it there. Now, I really am making out that this game is more tedious than actually enjoyable to play, but that's not the case. At times, this game is actually fun. It's just incredibly old and is showing its age. Back in 1987, games weren't as laid out or diversified in terms of gameplay as they are today, so if you're planning on playing Metal Gear, I would honestly say be a little patient with it. It takes a while to get going, but it does actually get there in the end. That being said, if I was to recommend this game to anyone, it would have to be to a Metal Gear fan. 
You don't actually really need to play this game to understand the story going into the likes of Metal Gear Solid or pretty much any other game in the series. And to be honest, I don't see anyone who isn't a fan of Metal Gear actually playing this game. Like, if I wasn't a fan of the series, I honestly think I wouldn't have played this game ever. But taking myself out of that fan headspace and looking at this game from an unbiased critical perspective, I can see the potential this game had back in the day. And to be fair, this game does pioneer a lot of the features that would become synonymous with the series, even if they're a little tedious and not fully realised just yet. Overall, I give Metal Gear a solid, no pun intended, gag rating of 6 out of 10. It's a little rough around the edges, but definitely worth the experience if you're a fan of the series, or just like 8-bit games. And that is Metal Gear. It's where the series began, and truth be told, I don't think anyone back in 1987 thought that this game would go on to spark a massive franchise in the gaming industry. Now, a lot of the issues I have with this game are mostly resolved with the next title in this series, however, that is best left for another day. Tune in next time, we'll be taking a look at the next installment in this franchise, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Until then, I've been Sean, thank you very much for watching, and if you're going to take one thing away from this video, let it be this. For all your news, reviews, playthroughs, and previews, stick with Going All Gamer. What's wrong? Snake! Snake! Hello! If you're watching this, that means you made it to the end of the video, so congratulations on making it this far, I am very proud. If you like this video, then why not give it a thumbs up, and if you want to check out more of our videos, you can do so by clicking on the little things over here, I think that's where they are, I'm not too sure, or if you never want to miss out on one of our uploads, then all you have to do is click the controller icon, which should be over here, I think, not too sure, and then ring that bell to stay notified. Go on, treat yourself, you deserve it.